in the majestic yet ominous court of the dying Sultan Murad IV, a chilling decree echoes through the room. The death sentence for his own brother, Ibrahim. But fate, in the form of their formidable mother, Kosum Sultan, intervenes, preserving one life and perhaps unwittingly setting an empire on the path to decline. Why would Murad demand his brother's death, knowingly ending his family's dynasty? How did Sultan Ibrahim's reign contribute to the Ottoman Empire's downturn? And what happens when one grows up shackled not by iron, but by golden bars of royalty and fear? Today we will answer each of those questions as we go over the events that would create one of history's most deranged rulers, who would end up beginning the fall of the great Ottoman Empire. So for a little pretext before we begin today's episode, I've been told that I should give some fair warning that this show is very explicit and the humor can be a little crude and dark. So if any of you have an issue with me saying the following words, shit, fuck, fucking fuck, damn, ass, gummy wummies, or Jerry, then you may have some issues listening to this episode. Now that that's out of the way, let's begin by briefly going over how the Ottoman Empire came into being, and then get into the sultans before Ibrahim and Murad that would push the snowball from the top of the mountain that would turn into an avalanche of issues they would try to overcome. The rise of the Ottoman Empire can be traced back to the late 13th century, starting with a small Anatolian beylik or principality, and growing into one of the world's most powerful states by the 16th century. The Ottoman Empire was founded around 1299 by Osman I, a leader of a tribe in western Anatolia, or modern-day Turkey. The region was fragmented following the decline and fragmentation of the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum, Osman I took advantage of this power vacuum and began to expand his territory, initially towards Byzantine lands. Osman's son, Orhan, captured the city of Bursa in 1326 and made it the new capital of the Ottoman state. The conquest of Thrace, which started under Orhan and continued under his successors, brought the Ottomans to the doorstep of Constantinople, the the Byzantine capital. The Ottomans began to absorb other Turkish states and also extended their control over the Balkans. The Ottoman Empire's major rise to power occurred in the 15th century in 1453 under the rule of Mehmed the Conqueror. The Ottomans captured Constantinople, marking the end of the Byzantine Empire. This monumental event cemented the Ottomans' power and made them a dominant force in the region that no one really wanted to fuck with because of how brutal they were to the nobility and commoners in Constantinople. It was said they would put on a gladiatorial-style show where they would force families to kill each other, promising them that the last one standing would be allowed to flee and live. After the winners killed their family members, they would then be placed into a room where they would wait before being released and then given a champion's feast which consisted of a dolma and sarma and rice. Uh, then the filling of the sarma was shredded meat. And if they asked for seconds, or once they were finished eating, they'd bring in the meat bucket they used, which would contain the hen- heads of their recently slaughtered family members, causing them to have a psychotic break where they would begin shitting themselves and flinging it around the walls of the room. Um, and then they would stay in that room until they would die of dehydration. If, if you bought that, that's... No, uh, no, I'm sorry. I, that was the first little fake out. But uh, they, uh, the Ottomans were actually very surprisingly tolerant to the nobility and commoners. And instead of, uh, instead of killing them, they chose to ransom the majority of them and only killed people if they fought back after being captured and didn't do the sick and twisted shit that I just described. 
that I probably need to go talk to a therapist about since that was a, that was a little too easy to think of. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, the reign of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent from 1520 to 1566 marked the peak of Ottoman power. Suleiman expanded the empire into the southeast Europe, including Hungary and parts of the Middle East, including Egypt and much of the Arabian Penins- Peninsula. The empire was also a major naval power, controlling key maritime trade routes, uh, including parts of the Black Sea, the Aegean Sea, and the Mediterranean. So in summary, uh, the rise of the Ottoman Empire was a gradual process, built on strategic military conquests and shrewd political maneuvering. They exploited the weakness of their neighbors and capitalized on key geographic locations to control trade routes. And by the 16th century, the empire had grown from a small Anatolian principality to a vast empire, covering parts of three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. So with that out of the way, let's take a dive into the feuds and the rulers that would eventually lead into Ibrahim the Mad taking over and absolutely wrecking the empire's future. Let's begin with Ahmed I, who was Ibrahim's father. Ahmed ascended the throne after his father's death in 1603, at the age of 13, when his powerful grandmother, Safiye Sultan, was still alive. With his ascension to the throne, the power struggle in the harem flared up, because his grandma and mom would fight to gain more power and influence. Eventually, Ahmed decided he maybe cared more about his mom and banished his grandma, because, you know, mom mom is just a little more important than you, grandma, so suck it. (laughs) But uh, Ahmed's uncle Yahya... Uh, resented his ascension to the throne and spent his life scheming to become sultan. Ahmed broke with the traditional fratricide following previous enthronements and did not order the execution of his brother Mustafa. Which, by the way, the the fratricides were pretty fucking wild. Um, And the way that they would do successions was crazy. So here, here is how they would typically go down. From the 14th through the late 16th centuries, the Ottomans practiced open succession, which was essentially a survival of the fittest scenario. It really did not matter if you were the fucking eldest or not for a while. (laughs) During their father's lifetime, all adult sons of the reigning um, Ottoman family, uh, family sultan, were given uh, provincial governorships in order to gain experience in administration um, which was a practice that's actually very common in Central Asian tradition. Uh, and they were accompanied and mentored by their two, uh, retinues, uh, ret- <laughs> retinues and tutors. And upon the death of their father, the reigning sultan, those, these sons would fight amongst themselves for the succession until one emerged triumphant. Their fights were very similar to the hit 1998 show Celebrity Deathmatch and was the main entertainment for commoners. They had open gambling circuits on who would be the first to become sultan and then the last one to be <laughs> sultan as uh, just because you were first did not guarantee you were sultan for that long. And since the latter would take years, uh, they would allow for pools to be placed on each of the former sultan's sons and as soon as one of them would die, the money pot on that kid would be evenly dispersed between the remaining sons. This would lead to many of the commoners teaming up with the son they bet on, and they would participate in battles with them to kill the other sons. <laughs> Which would be... It's kind of the truth. Uh, while, while the gambling aspect of it may not be entirely true uh, with the commoners, many of the nobility would bank on one or two of the sons being enthroned and make power moves to move themselves up in the hierarchy of the empire and would manipulate things behind the scenes all the time. The most common manipulators were the grand viziers, uh, viziers, and also the mothers of the sons, uh, as the sultans would typically have a harem, or uh, many concubines, and whichever concubine's son became the the sultan, they would gain the title, uh, a very coveted and uh, very influential title in the hierarchy of Vildali Sultan or Mother of the Sultan, uh, which is very, very important and gives them quite a bit of power, as you'll you'll see later on. 
Uh, but this would lead to them um, doing some nasty backstabbing and possibly sleeping around to get their son the support they'd need to become the sultan. Typically, the first son to reach the capital and seize control of the court would usually become the new ruler. The proximity of a cesad or prince, to Constantinople, improved his chances of success, simply because he could hear of his father's death, seize control of the Ottoman court in the capital, and declare himself sultan first. A sultan could thus hint at his preferred successor by giving a favorite son a closer governorship. Occasionally, the half-brothers would begin the struggle even before the death of their father. Under Suleiman the Magnificent, strife between his sons Mustafa and Selim caused such internal turmoil that Solomon ordered the deaths of both Mustafa and another son, uh, Bayezid, leaving Selim the sole heir. Which, oh man, could you imagine having to just like pick one of your kids and like you had to kill the other ones just to stop the fighting? Oh, I bet that broke his heart. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe he didn't give a shit. He was like, ah, I like this one the most. <laughs> During the reigns of Suleiman I and Selim II, the Haseki Sultan, or chief consort, rose to greater prominence, gaining power within the imperial harem. The favorite was able to maneuver to ensure the succession for one of her sons. This led to a short period of the eldest son just having the claim to the throne. However, when the Sultan had already defeated his brothers and potential rivals for the throne in battle, these Sultans had the problem of many half-brothers who could act as the focus for rival factions. Thus, to prevent attempts at seizing the throne, reigning sultans practiced frat- fratricide upon ascension, starting with Murad I in 1362. Both Murad III and his son Mohammed III had their half-brothers murdered. The killing of all the new sultans' brothers and half-brothers, who were usually quite numerous because sul- these sultans like just fucked like rabbits, was traditionally done by manual strangling with a silk cord. Which, hey, I mean, if you gotta, you gotta strangle someone, might as well do it with silk. <laughs> and fun side note, uh, it, is, it is thought that the first documented case of erotic asphyxiation was actually one of the princes of the Ottoman Empire, who is reported to have become erect while being choked and ejaculated during it. Um, It wouldn't be further noted upon until the late 1600s where observers at hangings would notice that men would get hard and come during it, which, I mean, talk about a splash zone. Am I right? (laughs) God, could you imagine being at a hanging and you just push on your face? Oh, gross. But they're dead. So, you know, Um, yeah, I, I do not envy whoever had to clean that up. Uh, doctors would go on to note that it was uh, so common that for every three people hanged, at least one would get an erection and come. Uh, it was also noted that women would become aroused as well. Uh, so, you know, that's, yeah, that's pretty cool shit. <laughs> Anyways, as the centuries passed, the ritual killing was gradually replaced by lifetime solitary confinement in the golden cage or kafis, uh, a room in the harem from where the sultan's brother could never escape unless they became heir presumptive. Mohammed III was the last sultan to have previously held a provincial governorship. Sons now remained within the harem until the death of their father. This not only denied them the ability to form powerful factions capable of usurping their father, but also denied them the opportunity to have children while their father remained alive. And imagine growing up in a family so crippled by fear, you couldn't trust your own children not to kill you. (laughs) <laughs> and you know what? Actually, I um, I kind of do get it. You know, my my two year old will just stare at me sometimes and say shit that has me convinced he's he's plotting a hostile takeover. Like, oh hi dad, which is obviously a reference to the two thousand three movie The Room. But instead of Mark, he chose Dad just to throw me off and hinting he plans on offing me like how Johnny offs himself at the end of the film, possibly. Also, whenever I wake up, he's usually awake first and is just laying on me, lapping or faking sleep. And I used to think he was just trying to cuddle me closer and show affection to me by hugging me. But after reading this, I know he's been trying to strangle me. He 
isn't trying to give me a hug. He's feigning affection, so I let my guard down so he can send me to an internal rest. I fucking know he is, and I'm not crazy. When Mohammed's son came to the throne as Ahmed I, he had no children of his own. Moreover, <laughs> as a minor, there was no evidence he could have children. This had the potential to create a crisis of succession and led to a gradual end to fratricide, which would ca also cause many in the palace to think of and find new ways to consolidate power that they could become that could become a threat to the sultans. So instead of visiting Allah at the hands of a janissary with some silk, uh, Mustafa was sent to live at the old palace at the Bayezid, uh, along with their grandmother, Safiye Sultan. This was most likely due to Ahmed's young age. He had not yet demonstrated his ability to, to sire children. And Mustafa, uh, blah, 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 blah. and Mustafa was then the only other candidate for the Ottoman throne. His brother's execution would have endangered the dynasty and is really the only reason he didn't get the golden garret, uh, garot treatment that his other brothers got. Ahmed's mother tried to interfere in his affairs and influence his, his decision because she wanted to control his communication and movements, probably to show other schemers the sultan was her, pu pu her puppet and not anyone else's. In the earlier part of Ahmed's rule, he showed decision and vigor, which were not indica indicative by the way he would conduct himself since he was a fucking 13-year-old child. <laughs> the wars in Hungary and Persia, which attended his ascension, terminated unfavorably for the empire. Its prestige was further tarnished by the Treaty of Zisvatorok, signed in 1606 when Ahmed was 16 whereby the annual tribute paid by Austria was abolished. Following the crushing, crushing defeat in the Ottoman Safavid War against the neighboring rivals, the Safav Safavid Empire, led by Shah Abbas the Great, and so Georgia, Azerbaijan, and other vast territories in the Caucasus, uh, were ceded back to Persia via the Treaty of Nasrul Pasha in 1612, territories that had been temporarily conquered in the Ottoman Safavid War. And the other war wars they had to go through were the wars with the uh, Habsburgs. The long Turkish war between the Ottomans and the Habsburg monarchy had been going on for over a decade by the time Ahmed ascended the throne. Grand Vizier Malkosh Ali Pasha marched to the Western Front from Constantinople on June 3rd, 1604, and arrived in Belgrade, but died there. So, the absolute legend, Mehmed Pasha, uh, Mehmed Pasha, was appointed as the Grand Vizier and the commander of the Western Army. Under Mehmed Pasha, the Western Army recaptured Pest and Vash, but failed to capture as... Um, as Tergom, as the siege was lifted due to unfavorable weather and the objections of the soldiers, because they were whiny and their feet hurt. Meanwhile, the Prince of Transylvania, Stephen Bokske, uh, who struggled for the region's independence and had formerly supported the Habsburgs, sent a messenger to the Porte asking for help. Upon the promise of help, his forces also joined the Ottoman forces in Belgrade. With this help, the Ottoman army besieged the Estergom and captured it on the 4th of November, 1605. Buxkai, with Ottoman help, captured Nove Zemki, uh, and forces under Tiraki Hassan Pasha took uh, Visprem and Palota. Sarhos Ibrahim Pasha, the Belerpe of um, Nagriskanza, which uh, Belerpe is essentially like a commander, attacked the Austrian region of Istria. However, with the uh, Jalali revolts in Anatolia more dangerous than ever and a defeat in the Eastern Front, Mehmed Pasha was called to Constantinople, and this absolute legend of Mehmed Pasha suddenly died there whilst preparing to leave for the East, which fucking sucks because he was kicking all of the ass and taking names, but sadly... This is real life, and shit like dying suddenly would happen. So, 
Kyuku Murad Pasha then paid by Austria and addressed, oh, then negotiated the peace of Zivrstorok, which abolished the tribute of 30,000 ducats paid by Austria and addressed the and addressed the Hab- Habsburg emperor as equal of the Ottoman sultan. And the Jalali revolts were a strong factor in the Ottomans' acceptance of the terms. This signaled the end of Ottoman growth in Europe and proved that the sultanate was weakening. So let's go ahead and talk about the Jalali revolts a little bit because it's very important to understand context later on as to why many viewed the sultans as weak and why a lot of the reforms had to take place during Murad's reign. Resentment over the war with the Habsburgs and heavy taxation, along with the weakness of the Ottoman military response, combined to make the reign of Ahmed I the zenith of the Jalali revolt. Tavil Ahmed launched a revolt soon after the coronation of Ahmed I and defeated Nasuh Pasha and the Belar Bey of Anatolia, or like military commander, of Anatolia, uh, uh, Kedekhan Ali Pasha. Meanwhile, oh my god, they make these names so fucking difficult. Khan Bula Togulu Ali Pasha united his forces with Drus Sheik, and they all had the same fucking last name. It's There's so many Ali Pashas that it's like you want to refer them refer to them by their first name, but their first names are Im- impossible for me to pronounce. I've, I've learned a couple languages, and holy shit, that is difficult. That be, being as a, a, I've learned a couple languages, they're Latin-based, or love languages, so it, you know, doesn't really affect over here, where it's just so many different, like, vocal sounds. Anyways. Okay. United his forces with the Druze Sheikh Man, Manuglu Fekhedin to defeat the Amir of Tripoli, Sefugulu, Yusuf. You guys look up those names and pronounce it if you want, because I can't. I tried. I looked up pronunciation, guys, for a lot of this. Nope, I'm not remembering all of it. I tried. I can't. I don't have the time. He went on to take control of the Adana area, forming an army and issuing coins. His forces routed the army of the newly appointed commander, or I guess also like kind of like a governor of Aleppo, Hussein Pasha. Grand Vizier Boshnak Dervish Mehmed Pasha was executed for the weakness he showed against the Jalalis. Or Jalalis? Yeah, it's whatever. He was replaced by uh, Kuyu- Kuyuku Murad Pasha, who marched to Syria with his forces to defeat the 30,000 strong rebel army with great difficulty. On October 24th of 1607, meanwhile, he pretended to forgive the rebels in Anatolia and appointed the rebel Kalender Golu, who was active in Manisa and Bursa as the military leader of Ankara. This would come back to bite him in the ass later. Baghdad was recaptured in 1607 as well. Kambulu Togulu Ali Pasha fled to Constantinople asking for forgiveness from Ahmed I, who did forgive him. He appointed him to uh, Timisora and later Belgrade. Uh, but then executed him due to his misrule there. Which, to be fair, he did give this man three fucking chances, which is, you know, pretty goddamn fair, in my opinion, <laughs> especially for back then. Meanwhile, Kalin de Golu was not allowed in the city by the people of Ankara and rebelled again, only to be crushed by Murad Pasha's forces. Kalin de Golu ended up fleeing to Persia, Murad Pasha then suppressed some smaller revolts in central Anatolia and suppressed other Jalali chiefs by inviting them to join the army. Due to the widespread violence of the Jalali revolt, a great number of people had fled their villages and a lot of of villages were destroyed. Some military chiefs had claimed these abandoned villages as their property. This deprived the the Porte of tax income and on the 30th of September of 1609, Ahmed I issued a letter guaranteeing the rights of the villagers, uh, which promptly pissed off a lot of military leaders and caused them to think that the sultanate didn't have uh, the best outlook for them. Uh, He then worked on the resettlement of abandoned villages, uh, really showed how far the sultanate had fallen and how their authority was beginning to be easily challenged. 
The new Grand Vizier, Nashur Pasha, did not want to fight uh, with the Safavids. The Safavid Shah also sent a letter saying that he was willing to sign a peace treaty with which he would have to send 200 loads of silk every year to Constantinople with a note attached saying, uh, just in case this uh, kafis slash not killing your brother thing doesn't work out, with love, your boy, Safavid Shah. <laughs> oh man, I wish that note was there. Like, <laughs> like you just sent that to be sassy. But on the 20th of November, 1612, the Treaty of Nasuk Pasha was signed, which ceded all the lands to... Um, which ceded all the lands the Ottoman Empire had gained in the War of 1578-90 to 90 back to Persia and reinstated the 1,555 boundaries. However, the peace ended in 1615, not even three years later, when Shah did not send the 200 loads of silk, uh, probably because uh, Ahmed really didn't want to kill his brother. And he's like, well, why do you need the silk then? You're not going to be <laughs> garroting him with it. So on the 22nd of May, 1615, Grand Vizier Okus Mehmed Pasha was assigned to organize an attack on Persia. Mehmed Pasha delayed the attack till the next year until the Safavids made their preparations and attacked Ganja. In April of 1616, Mehmed Pasha left Aleppo with a large army and marched to Yerevan, where he failed to take the city and withdrew to Azizram. He was removed from his post and replaced by Damat Halil, Halil Pasha. Halil Pasha went for win- the winter to Diyarbakir, while the Khan of Crimea, Kanebek Giray, attacked the areas of Ganja. Uh, and Nakhitshevan and Julfa. During his reign, Ahmed would sire 13 sons and had all of them live in Topkapi uh, Palace because it was, uh, it was a fun place and there was a harem available for them of at least 300 women uh, where, who they couldn't fuck at all. Uh, but it does make me think like they, they each had to get assigned a certain amount of girls just in case, you know, uh, Ahmed bit the dust uh, so then they could, you know, start fucking. And the one that had 24 women... Uh, probably, you know, was uh, the favorite son and therefore would tr- become the next sultan. <laughs> so, uh, no, not really. It was, it was going to be the eldest. Um, anyways, after many battles, Ahmed would go on to construct the Ahmed Mosque and write a bunch of poetry before snuffing it. <laughs> so Ahmed I died of typhus and gastric bleeding on the 22nd of November, 1617 at the Topkapi Palace, Istanbul. He was buried in the Ahmed the First Mausoleum, or the Ahmed Mosque that I had mentioned earlier that he had had constructed. So Ahmed's death created a dilemma never before experienced by the Ottoman Empire. Multiple princes were now eligible for the Sultanate, and all of them lived in Topkapi Palace, a court faction headed by Selih, uh, Islam, Oh my God, Selhul Islam, Hassad Effendi and Sofu Mehmed Pasha decided to enthrone Mustafa instead of Ahmed's son, Osman. Sofu uh, Mehmed argued that Osman was too young to be enthroned without pissing a bunch of people off. <laughs> Which is fair, because the kid was pretty young, but also Ahmed took over at like 13, so who really gives a shit? You all know it's the Grand Vizier that's running the show, or the mom. <laughs> so the chief eunuch, Mustafa Aga objected, citing Mustafa's mental problems. But he was overruled, and so Mustafa's rise created uh, a new succession of principle, of seniority, that would last until the end of the empire. It was the first time an Ottoman sultan was succeeded by his brother instead of his son. His mother, Halime Sultan, became the uh, Valide Sultan, as well as regent and wielded great power. Due to Mustafa's mental condition, she acted as regent and exercised power more directly. So she took control. She was the one essentially acting as sultan for him. It was hoped that regular social contact would improve Mustafa's mental health, but his behavior remained eccentric. He pulled off the turbans of his viziers and yanked their beards. Uh, Others observed him throwing coins to birds and fish. The Ottoman historian Ibrahim um, Viv... Pevechi, or Peshevi, wrote, This situation was seen by all men of state and the people, 
and they understood that he was mentally disturbed. Really, to me, though, it just seems like he liked fucking around with people and was bored out of his mind since his mom was running shit for him, basically. Um, and because his mom was running shit, uh, it, it caused uh, a lot of, like, intricate port, uh, court uh, dynamics to happen. And he and Mustafa really was never more than a tool of the court uh, cliques at the to- Topkapi Palace. And so in 1618, after a short rule, another palace faction deposed him in favor of his young uh, nephew, Osman II, um, probably because Qasem Sultan really wanted to be in charge and wanted to take power away from Ahmed's mother. Um, and Mustafa was sent back to the old palace where he probably yanked on people's beards and, you know, might have even tugged a dick or two just for fun. Uh, nevertheless, according to Baki Teskan, there's not enough evidence to properly establish that Mustafa was mentally imbalanced when he came to the throne. Mustafa made a number of excur- uh, excursions to the arsenal of the, and the Navy docks, examining various sorts of arms and taking an active interest in the munition supply of the army and the navy. One of the dispatches of Baron de Sensi, the French ambassador, suggested that Mustafa was interested in leading the Safavid campaign himself and was entertaining the idea of wintering in Konya for that purpose. Moreover, one contemporary observer provides an explanation for the coup, which does not mention the incapacity of Mustafa. Baron de Sansi ascribes the deposition as a political conspiracy between the Grand Admiral, Admiral Ali Pasha and Chief Eunuch Mustafa Aga, who were angered by the former's removal from office upon Sultan Mustafa's ascension. They may have circulated rumors of the Sultan's mental instability uh, subsequent to the coup in order to legitimize it, and in doing so, succeeded in getting Osman on the throne. So Mustafa might have not just been crazy. Like I said, he's probably just a little bit weird and into weird shit, which people, you know, took for, oh, he's fucking nuts. In all reality, he just didn't talk to people because he was chained up for so long. Anyways, Osman II was born at Topkapi Palace, Constantinople, uh, Constantinople, the son of Sultan Ahmed I, and one of, uh, and one of his concerts, uh, Mar Firuz Hatun, uh, according to later traditions, at a young age, his mother had paid great, a great deal of attention to Osman's edu- education. As a result of which, Osman II became a known poet which, uh, and was believed to have mastered many languages, including Arabic, Persian, Greek, Latin, and Italian. Which is like, cool, but he wasn't able to like, speak pig Latin, so like, was it really all that cool? I don't know. <laughs> nah, he's pretty dope. Osman was born 11 months after his uh, father Ahmed's transition to the throne. Oh shit, oh, that means Ahmed was like boning right at 13. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, I didn't even think about that till now. Uh, he was trained in the palace. According to foreign observers, he was, he was one of the most cultured of Ottoman princes. Osman was uh, 14 when the coup against Mustafa took place. Despite his youth, Osman II soon sought to assert himself as a a ruler, and after securing the empire's eastern border by signing a peace treaty with Safavid Persia, he personally led the Ottoman campaign against Poland and King Sigismund III during the Moldavian uh, Magnate Wars where he would get his ass handed to him by the Polish. Uh, Forced to sign a humiliating peace treaty uh, with them after the Battle of uh, Chosim in September or October of 1621, Osman II returned home to Constantinople in shame, blaming the cowardice of the Janissaries and the insufficiency of his statesmen for his humiliation. It was their fault, not mine. It was all their fault. But really, it was, that was probably correct, because at this point, the Janissaries had become more interested in politics and would resist military campaigns they deemed unprofitable for themselves or risky. And the one that Osman tried to do was risky as fuck. They would use Osman's lack of representation at home to sway statesmen against the war. The reason why Osman II had no representation was the absence of a female power basis in the harem. From 1620 until Osman's death, since Osman's mother was exiled basically as soon as he took, you know, took over, uh, again, because Qasem didn't want really anyone else to be in power. 
and was and Osmond's mother was also very likely assassinated. Uh, they had a governess uh, appointed as a stand-in valide or mother of the sultan. Um, and the mother of the sultan is in charge of the harem and has great influence in politics, like I said. And she could not counterbalance the contriving of Mustafa's, uh, Mustafa the First's mother in the old palace, who held heavy sway with many in the palace and was slowly trying to regain power. Although Osman did not have a loyal chief eunuch at his side, uh, this could not... Uh, although Osman did have a loyal chief eunuch at his side, this could not compensate for the absence of what in the politics of that period was a winning combination. Uh, the uh, mother of the sultan and the chief eunuch. If you had both of those, you were set. Especially in the case of Osman, who was young and a bit too ambitious. So in the autumn of 1620, Ozzy Bey Iskender Pasha seized the secret letter sent to Transylvanian Prince Bethlen Gabor to Istanbul and sent it to Poland. And Osman also became a veteran of the people around him. He decided to embark on a Polish expedition, continu continuing preparations for the Polish campaign. Uh, neither cold nor famine, uh, nor the English ambassador John Eyre uh, could deter Osman. The ambassador of Sig uh, Sigismund III, the king of Poland, was brought into Istanbul despite the severe colds. The Janissaries and army were not willing to go on a campaign, regardless of their conditions, which made Osman II much more paranoid. As the political climate became unstable as fuck, and so as a precaution, though it does not make clear why, he orders the execution of his 15-year-old half-brother, uh, Sehzad, or Prince Mohammed, by having him hanged, basically reinstating fratricide again, uh, to a much lesser extent, though. Sources are unclear uh, if Mehmed was able to come during his hanging, uh, as more research needs to be done. Following the murder of Sehazad Mehmed on the 12th of January, 1621, a severe snowstorm started in Istanbul, indicating that while Mehmed may not have been able to come, Sky Daddy God certainly did, and oh man, he busted one or two nuts all over Istanbul. The people of Istanbul were drastically affected by the cold, which increased local violence, and on the 24th of January, uh, more so than the palace murder, uh, the, this, they would begin rioting and fighting each other uh, over, <laughs> just like over supplies and like basic needs. Um, this is the biggest natural disaster that will hit the capital in Osman's reign. Uh, and Bostanz, uh, Bostan Zade Yacha Effendi, one of uh, one of those who lived through this cold, tells that the uh, tells that the golden horn in the Bosphorus were covered with ice in the end of January, uh, beginning of February, meaning it was just frozen over for like a solid uh, month, which is fucking nuts. Uh, between Uskudar and Bes uh, Besikitas. The men walk around and go to Uskudar. Uh, they came from Istanbul on foot and started a famine, essentially. It was snowing for 15 days. It was so cold that the flakes were frozen from the severity of the cold. But the river was open between Sarabunuru and Uskudar because this natural disaster... Oh, and because of this natural disaster, 30,000 froze between Uskudar and Istanbul from the cold which would cause even more instability in the Sultanate as more pressure and blame would pla be placed upon Osman II. Uh, this was a complete shit show for Osman and began taking notice that the Janissaries had become a little too powerful and influential and learned about talks of conspiracies against him going on in coffee shops, which is just, you know, like, so 1621 behavior, like Barrel Barrel. So, seeking a counterweight to Janissary influence, Osman II closed their coffee shops and started planning to create a new and more loyal army consisting of Anatolian Sekvans. The result, unsurprisingly, was a palace uprising by the Janissaries, who promptly imprisoned the young sultan in Yedikule Fortress in Istanbul. And then Osman II was strangled to death. Um, sources are also unclear if he was able to come or not. My bet is he did. 
Uh, now here's my main complaint about Osman. He fucking knew that these people were out to get him and wasn't more secretive about build, building up his army. Had anyone else less cocky and more cunning been in his shoes, I am sure they would have, one, found ways to appease the Janissary leaders, uh, while two, secretly start infighting within the organization using spies or buying out people. I, I, I don't know. Maybe he did try that and it just wasn't recorded or something, but I think he was cocky enough to think that, you know, shit like him getting strangled to death wouldn't happen to him. So after Osman's death, his ear was cut off and presented to Halime Sultan and Sultan Mustafa I to confirm his death. Mustafa would no longer need to fear his nephew. It was the first time in the Ottoman history that a sultan was executed by the Janissaries, and a case of regicide occurred, and a case that regicide had occurred, and would have an adverse effect for future rulers, as many realized that being sultan did not equal being untouchable anymore. And so many more plots began to brew as Mustafa took the throne again. But Mustafa had a trump card scheming for him. And that was his brother, uh, his mother and brother-in-law, Davud Pasha. Mustafa commenced his second reign by executing all those who had taken any part in the murder of Sultan Osman. More than likely, Pasha and his mother planned this, but Hukha Omer Effendi, the chief of the rebels, the Kizar, uh, uh, Kizlar Aga Suleiman Aga, the Vizier Dali, uh, Dilaver Pasha, and the Kem Makam Ahmed Pasha, the Defeter Baki Pasha, <laughs> and the General of the Janissaries Ali Aga were executed. Uh, because they fucking knew if any of them were left unchecked and they made one wrong move, they were getting choked out and possibly coming from <laughs> from it next, like Mustafa's siblings did. <laughs> um, I keep referencing that because uh, it's it, it's just insane to me that a third of people who were hung f- fucking got an erection and, and came like <laughs> um, and that cold hard sticky fact is now ingrained in my brain and there's no chance in hell that some stat that that same stat did not affect the Ottomans and everyone needs to realize that if you're going to choke a dude out there is a 33% chance he will get hard and come all over you, okay? Just realize that. So if you're thinking about choking someone out, you're probably going to get cummed on. Anyways, Mustafa's mental condition was unimproved and was still a puppet controlled by his mother and brother-in-law, the Grand Vizier Kara Davud Pasha. He believed that Osman II was still alive and was seen searching for him throughout the palace, knocking on doors, and crying out to his nephew to relieve him of the burden of sovereignty. <sighs> Which is, that's so fucking sad, actually. Like, it seems like he actually cared about his nephew, at least a little bit. The present emperor, being a fool, was compared unfavorably with his predecessor, when in reality, it was his mother, Halim, uh, Halime Sultan, that was the de facto ruler as Valide Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, making most of his choices. And yeah, poor guy just really didn't want to rule. He just wanted to tug beards, feed coins to fish and birds. <laughs> it's, it's really fucking sad, honestly. Um, and he seemed to, again, like at least somewhat care about his nephew, uh, which is really, really rare for um, honestly anyone in the Ottoman family to feel anything towards each other besides fear and animosity. But Political instability, uh, which was generated by the conflict between the Janissaries and the Sipahis, uh, followed by the Abaza Rebellion, which occurred when the governor general of Izizram, followed by, um, oh, Izizram, Abaza Mehmed Pasha, decided to march on Istanbul to avenge the murder of Osman II. The regime tried to end the conflict by executing Kara Davud Pasha, but Abaza Mohammed continued his advance. Clerics and Kemankes Kara Ali Pasha prevailed upon Mustafa's mother to allow the deposition of her son. She agreed on the condition that Mustafa's life would be spared, and he was able to spend the rest of his days doing what he loved, which was weird, but hey, it made him happy. And uh, only mildly annoyed people uh, whose beards he tugged, or dicks. And so the 11-year-old Murad IV 
son of Ahmed I and Qasim, was enthroned on the 10th of September, 1623. And Mustafa would end up dying um, just, well, I guess 16 years later on January 20th of 1639. Um, it, one source states that he would die of epilepsy, which was caused by being imprisoned for 34 out of 38 years of his life. He's buried in the courtyard of the Hagia Sophia. Well, enough de- about dead people. Let's go ahead and talk about another dead person, uh, Murad IV. Uh, Murad IV was for a long time under the control of his relatives, and during his early years as sultan, his mother, Qasim Sultan, essentially ruled through him. In this period, the Safavid Empire invaded Iraq. Northern Anatolia erupted in revolts, and in 1631, the Janissaries stormed the palace and killed the Grand Vizier, among others. At the age of 16 in 1628, he had his brother-in-law, Kara Mustafa Pasha, executed for a claimed action against the law of God. This was done as he re- was reportedly tied to a corruption network, and Murad was like, nah, I ain't gonna die by any of y'all's bitch-ass hands trying to suffocate me and make me come and shit. Fuck that. <laughs> Or, you know, maybe he said something a little more refined than that. Um, An epidemic which started in the summer of 1625 and called the plague of Bayram Pasha spread to threaten the population of Istanbul. On average, a thousand people died every day. That's right. A fucking thousand people died every day. Uh, That is nuts to think about. I grew up in a small rural rural town, and essentially in one day, the entire population of that town would have been fucking dead. I, <laughs> I cannot imagine that shit going down. It's just, that's too much for me. The people fled to Okmandani to escape the plague. The situation was worse in the countryside of Istanbul. So yeah, my, my small rural ass town uh, would have been fucked had something like that ever happened there. Murad IV was apparently a huge fan of the Puritans' ideals and banned alcohol, tobacco, and coffee in Constantinople, which I'm sure pissed no one off. Uh, He was known to patrol the streets of Constantinople in civilian clothes, enforcing the bans himself. Best part about this is he was a known alcoholic. (laughs) I shit you not. He loved to fucking drink. It was definitely rules for thee, not for me, because he needed to uh, kind of enforce power. Like, these pans were... These bans were part of his larger efforts to curb what he saw as immoral behavior and decadence. Um, And pray to God he didn't catch you breaking this ban, because if you were caught, you were fucking executed. Which, if this shit were applied today, I... (laughs) You know, like, this is kind of how I imagine life would be like if Mormon God was real and went, uh, was back on earth. And you you can bet your sweet ass if he got uh, a whiff of coffee or cigs on you, uh, you're, you're being obliterated into, into space dust. And you know Jay Swizzle Smith would 100% rat your ass out. So you need to be extra sneaky and get Lucy to help you hide any of your shit. So, anyways. Uh, this was a vigorous effort by Murad to, to restore the authority of the Sultanate, which had been eroding in the face of political corruption, military rebellion, and societal decay. As part of these efforts... He implemented a series of strict moral and social reforms, inspired by his understanding of Islamic law and the need for social order. He restored the judicial regulations by very strict punishments, including execution. He once strangled a grand vizier for the reason that the official had beaten his mother-in-law and had to clean up afterwards. Uh, <clears throat> oh, yeah, and he had to clean up afterwards. Uh, sources do not state uh, what it was. He had to clean off himself, but uh, y'all fucking know it was come. That that Grand Vizier came as uh, he was being strangled. Y- you know it. Many of these reforms would lead to a huge re- uh, resentment of the Sultanate, and while it may have temporarily temporarily regiven them power uh, and some sense of security back, it pretty much fucked over whoever would be the ru- next ruler. Also, due to all the issues caused by his predecessors. He was paranoid as fuck, and if he caught any whiff of, well, we could have replaced him with an ex-half-brother, that half-brother would be immediately killed, either by hanging or strangling. He did this until he had only one brother left, Ibrahim. 
uh, who was 20 at the time of the last brother being executed in 1635, and only left him because, one, uh, so far any sons that Murad had had uh, died during infancy. I imagine that they fucking knew what waited for them, and they did not want any part of that shit, and that is why they, they gave up on life, either in the womb or once they got out, because they're like, nah, fuck this, I'm going to go back. <laughs> and then, uh, two, Ibrahim... Ibrahim to him, to Murad, seemed pretty dumb and crazy, as Ibrahim would have random mood swings and talk to himself a lot. Uh, This is probably because Ibrahim has been essentially forced into the cafes or like the golden cell uh, since he's been eight. And uh, that's that's really fucking sad. (laughs) Um, And then number three, at this point, uh, Murad IV still cared about the Ottoman line continuing. So... Now we get into a couple of his wars that he has that will kind of fuck over Ibrahim a little bit. So Murad IV's reign was most notable for the Ottoman Safavid War against Persia, in which Ottoman forces managed to conquer Azerbaijan, uh, occupying Tabriz, Hamadan, and capturing Baghdad in 1638. The Treaty of Zuhab that followed the war generally reconfirmed the borders as agreed by the Peace of uh, Amai. Uh, Amasya, with eastern Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Dagestan staying Persian, western Georgia stayed Ottoman. Mesopotamia was irrevocably lost for the Persians. The borders fixed as a result of the war are more or less the same as the present border line between Iraq and Iran today. Murad IV himself commanded the Ottoman army in the last years of the war, because, you know, he may have talked a lot of game and you know, he at least kind of tried to back back it up, you know. While uh, so while he was encamped in Baghdad, Murad IV is known to have met ambassadors of the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan, uh, Mir Zarif, and Mir Baraka, who presented 1,000 pieces of finely embroidered cloth and even armor. Murad IV gave them the finest weapons, saddles, and kaftans, and ordered his forces to accompany the Mughals to the port of Bar- uh, Basra where they set sail to the uh, to Thata and finally Surat. Um, in, in addition to the, into all the warring, uh, Murad actually had a little bit of a soft spot. Murad IV wrote many poems. He used the Muradi pen name for his poems. He also liked testing people with riddles. And you better pray to God you were smart enough to answer it correctly. Or, like, you'd get laughed at. Which is like, that shitty man makes you feel bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, honestly, despite Murad being a brutal authoritarian, he actually did like to play around a bit and wouldn't punish people for getting a riddle incorrect. Um, instead, he once a, he once wrote a poetic ri- riddle and announced that whoever came with the correct answer would get a generous reward. Sihadi Bey, a poet from Enderon school, gave the correct answer and Murad promoted their status in society and gave them some money. So, you know, it's pretty cool. Uh, Murad would try multiple times to have children and many sons, uh, and had many sons, but all of them would die, as I said earlier, um, super, like, in infancy or super early into their childhood. And uh, due to Murad IV uh, being a hypocrite, uh, he would become sick with cirrhosis. um, And hilarious, it was linked to his heavy drinking uh, that probably caused it. Um, you know, in all reality, his bans honestly were just to assert fear and make it easier for the Sultanate to remain in power. Um, and you know, this kind of makes me wonder what sort of laws our country has passed with similar goals in mind. <coughs> War's on, War on drugs. <coughs> uh, you know, cause, uh, I bet you all of those politicians fucking do a little Coke or a little weed all the time. Uh, but none of them. They, they just wanted to uh, assert power and uh, make us fear them, essentially, or, you know, fear, fear the government a little bit. Anyways, on the February 8th of 1640, Murad li- lay dying, surrounded by court physicians. His mother, Qasem Sultan, Grand Vizier, and some important religious leaders uh, were around him. While consulting with his Grand Vizier, Kamankes uh, Kara Mustafa Pasha, on how the succession will take place, he tells them he will not place the empire into the hands of a madman and orders, uh, orders Ibrahim's death with his dying breath. 
Those in attendance were stunned, to say the least, at this, uh, as it would be the end of the Ottomans. Luckily for Ibrahim, Qasim Sultan would intervene and not allow that to happen. No one's going to hurt her baby boy. Before we get into Ibrahim's rule, uh, let's go over what his life was like a little more, just to have a full context, uh, con- context as to why he goes on to do some of the most depraved and heinous shit you have ever heard of. Ibrahim was born on the 5th of November of 1615. He was the son of Sultan Ahmed I and Qasim Sultan. When Ibrahim was two, his father suddenly died, and Ibrahim's uncle Mustafa, as I mentioned earlier, became the new sultan. Uh, By that time, Qasim Sultan and her children, including young Ibrahim, had been sent to the old palace. After the succession of his brother Murad IV, Ibrahim was confined in the cafes, being only eight years old, uh, which this would really fuck him up later, as uh, as you'll see. Ibrahim watched as his uh, other brothers, Bayezid, Suleiman, and Qasim, over time, were executed by the order of Sultan Murad IV leading him to develop a type of Stockholm Syndrome where he believed he was only safe if he remained in the cafes, and it induced so many trust issues and paranoia into him that many believe he had already gone crazy as he had pretty much given up the hope of living and was convinced he was going to die next. Which, I mean, like, he was kind of right, though. Like, since, like, Maraud did kind of decide to kill him, he was... He wasn't wrong, so kind of justified. <laughs> After Murad's death, Ibrahim felt uh, Ibrahim was left the sole surviving prince of the dynasty. Upon being asked by Grand Vizier Kamankas Karab Mustafa Pasha to assume the sultanate, Ibrahim suspected Murad was still alive and plotting to trap him and straight up walked back into the cafe saying, nope, I'm good. Just keep me in here, guys. Like I, now nah, I'm good. I'm not going to bother anyone. Trust me. It's fine. Um, It took the combined persuasion of Qasem and the Grand Vizier, and he had to personally examine his brother's dead body before he would accept the throne. He was that fucking convinced his brother was still alive and it was just a trick to kill him. Which makes me wonder, like, what did they tell the other brothers when they went out to strangle him? Was it just like, oh, we're going to give you cake and cookies? (laughs) And then they just never came back. Oh, that's so sad to think about like Ibrahim just being like, oh, my, my brother's going to come back, right? Nope, he did. <laughs> oh, sad. Anyways, during the, <laughs> during the early years of Ibrahim's reign, he retreated from politics and turned increasingly to his harem for comfort and pleasure because in the cafes, he wasn't allowed to do anything, including fucking. So he more than likely dived deep into something uh, just to make up for lost time. You know, he was, he was pretty repressed, and so he, he had some exploring to do. And oh boy, did he, did he explore. His mother and Grand Vizier were more than happy to have him preoccupied while, uh, with this while they ruled the empire, and he made new potential heirs. During his sultanate, the harem achieved new levels of luxury in perfumes, textiles, and jewelry. His love of women and furs led him to have a room entirely lined with lynx and sable, uh, Sable, because of his infatuation with first, the French dubbed him Le Fou de Forest, uh, uh, Forest, uh, whatever. He was a fucking furry, and he he even wanted to fuck a cow. I I, I shit you not, like I'm not fucking with you here. Um, in a list of three things I found online from other historians use, uh, who use contemporary sources that he was reported to have done or wanted sexually. Uh, so number one, he liked to play horse. According to one report, Ibrahim frequently liked to assemble all of the virgins in his harem. He would order each of them to strip, and then he would run amongst them, neighing like a horse, ravishing one after the other. (laughs) He would also order them to kick and struggle against him because he got his jollies off when people resisted him while he was trying to have sex with them. Fucking red flag. Crimson. Two, he liked big girls. He would routinely send out men to find the biggest women they could find and bring them to his harem. And those poor girls were the ones he would ravish the most, even when they didn't want to, which made him enjoy the sex, well, really rape, more. It just made him 
raping just made it enjoyable for him, which is really, really fucked up. And then number three, and this is the craziest one, he got turned on by a cow vagina. And so he commissioned gold copies of the vagina and sent them around the empire to find a woman with a similar looking vagina. Fucking, can you imagine that shit? Just some dudes from the Sultan knocking on your door being like, hey, um, so I need to look at your wife's uh, pussy and then I need to look at your daughter's pussy. Um, and it's if it matches this, she's going to the harem. I don't care. Um, I'm not having the Sultan kill me. And they just break in, look look at the, the girl's pussy, see if it matched. And if they didn't, they'd move on. But if it got close, they'd like, okay, come in with us. Like, fuck it. <laughs> Crazy. Searchers eventually found a 350 pound woman with matching parts who became one of his favorite concubines. I am positive he tried to milk her and made her moo while they had sex. An account of his reign is given by Demetrius Cantemir. He wrote of Ibrahim, as Murad was wholly addicted to wine, so was, so was Ibrahim to lust. They say he spent all of his time in sensual pleasure, and when nature was exhausted with the frequent repetition of venereal delights, he endeavored to restore it with potions or commanded a beautiful virgin, richly habited, to be brought to him by his mother, the Grand Vizier, or some other great man. He covered the walls of his chambers with looking glasses so that his love battles might seem to be enacted in several places at once. He ordered his pillows to be stuffed with rich furs so that the bed designed for the imperial pleasure might be the more, all the more precious. Nay, he put sable skins under him in a notion that his lust might be flamed if his love toil were rendered more difficult by the glowing of his knees. He liked to watch himself while fucking and describe them as battles. This was some American cycle level of depravity, dude. Holy shit. Kara Mustafa Pasha remained as Grand Vizier during the first four years of Ibrahim's reign, and he is the only one who kept that empire fucking stable at all. He did it with the Treaty of Sison. He renewed peace with Austria, and during the same year, recovered Azov from the Cossacks. Kara Mustafa also stabilized the currency with coinage reform reform sought to stabilize uh, the economy with new land with a new land survey, reduced the number of janissaries, removed non-contributing members of, from state payrolls, and curbed the power of disobedient provincial governors. And you know this was fucking amazing. This guy honestly should have been Sultan. Like he knew what he was doing, and he took care of everything. And while this is great and helped keep the empire stable, unfortunately, by doing all of this, uh, he was deemed a threat by many and made one too many enemies. During these years, Ibrahim showed concern with properly ruling the empire, as shown in his handwritten communications with the Grand Vizier. Qatar Mustafa, in, in turn, wrote a memo on public affairs to coach his inexperienced master. Ibrahim's reply to Kara Mustafa's reports showed he had actually received a good education. Ibrahim often traveled in disguise, inspecting the markets of Istanbul and ordering the Grand Vizier to correct any problems he observed, which despite his depravity in the bedroom, really gave hope to many in the palace he would be a good ruler, eventually. Uh, but you know, sociopaths typically aren't dumb and they can hide shit pretty well, so... Ibrahim was often distracted by recurring headaches, probably from coming too much, to be honest. When you come and it's just like dry powder, you probably need to stop coming. But he, he, he just couldn't. Uh, he also had attacks of physical weakness. Since he was the only surviving male member of the Ottoman dynasty, Ibrahim was encouraged by his mother, Kosum Sultan, to distract himself with harem girls, and soon fathered three future sultans, Mehmed I, Solomon II, and Ahmed II. The distractions of the harem allowed Qasim Sultan to gain power and rule in his name. Uh, and she kept distracting him as she would personally go out and grab the girls that he would torture. Fucking, she was a monster in this too. 
to be honest. I mean, she later she kind of regret it, but at the same time, a fucking monster knowing the monster that her son is. Uh, and despite doing all this, she even fell victim to the Sultan's disfavor and left the Imperial Palace because she definitely overstepped and the cronies that Kosum and Ibrahim introduced into his court would manipulate Ibrahim into thinking it was a good idea to get rid of her. Ibrahim came under the influence of various unsuitable people, such as the mistress of the imperial harem, Sekpare Khatun, and the charlatan, Sensihoka, who pretended to cure the sultan's physical ailments. He was essentially a proto-Rasputin, and would claim to be this mystic of sorts that could cure, that could cure him. The reason, the reason why he ever got to the palace in the first place was because of Kosum, Ibrahim's mother, had invited him as a last-ditch effort to help cure Ibrahim of all of his issues, which is ironic as shit, because he would later be the one to convince Ibrahim to get rid of his mom. <laughs> so, you know, good job. Good job, Kosum. The, li- the latter, along with his allies, uh, Silhadar Yusuf Aga and uh, Sultan Azad Mehmed Pasha, enriched themselves with bribes and eventually usurped enough power to secure the execution of Grand Vizier Kara Mustafa. These bribes were primarily through those that Pasha had pissed off during the first few years of Ibrahim's, Ibrahim's reign. Uh, so rip, rip uh, Kara Mustafa. He was, uh, he was actually like the only thing that kept the empire stable. If he had lived, the uh, Ottoman Empire might honestly still be here today. Since Ihoka became Kan uh, Kadiasker or High Judge of Anatolia, Yusuf Aga was made Kabudan Pasha or Grand Ad- Admiral, and uh, Sultan Azad Mohammed became the Grand Vizier. Which, by the way, for a mystic like Sinsi to become that high ranking in Islam, uh, in, you know, Islam was pretty much a slap in the face um, to those that had devoted their lives to the religion and actually knew what the fuck they were talking about. So this pissed off a ton of religious leaders. In 1644, Maltese Corsairs seized a ship carrying high-status pilgrims to Mecca. Since the pirates had docked in Crete, Kapudan Yusuf Pasha encouraged, encouraged Ibrahim to invade the island. And Ibrahim was like, yeah, dude, yeah, I should like totally invade the island, huh? That would like be super cool and like rad, man. And uh, Kapudan was like, yeah, dude, fucking, fucking do it, man. Uh, and it started a huge war with Venice that lasted for 24 years. Crete would not completely fall under Ottoman dom- domination till 1669. In spite of the decline of La Serenissima, uh, Seren- Seren- Ven- uh, Ventinian ships won victories throughout the Aegean, capturing Tenedos and blockading the Dardanelles. Uh, with his cronies in power, Ibrahim's extravagant tendencies went unchecked. He raised eight concubines to the favored position of royal concert, consort, granting each riches and land. After legally marrying the concubine Teli Haseki, he ordered the palace of Ibrahim Pasha to be carpeted in uh, sable fair, furs and given to her. He would also routinely steal shit uh, that should have been his sister's and re-gift them to his concubines, which really pissed off his mother Kosum, who is uh, really starting to be like, well, you know, maybe he's not that much of my son anymore. (laughs) So mass discontent was caused by all of these actions, uh, especially the blockade of the Dardanelles, which created a lot of scarcities in the capital. Uh, Not enough food, not enough like luxuries at all. And the imposition of heavy taxes during a war economy to pay for Ibrahim's whims, essentially. He would tax people for shit that he started. Um, but really not, not only just that, but essentially due to all of the buildup from the previous sultans, just either fucking up and losing many of the money, land and power, or just straight up taking it away from them. Uh, most of their governors and military leaders were ready to kill the Ottomans and those in the Imperial palace. Cause just think about it. You have Ahmed who, while he wasn't all bad, did lose payments from Austria and lost tribute from Morocco, which wasn't entirely his fault. Um, then you had Mustafa, who was viewed as a crazy guy who just wanted to do weird shit. Then Osman II, who wanted to be super cool and go conquer a bunch of shit and nearly bankrupted his country and pissed off the Janissaries so much they killed him. 
Then you got Mustafa again for a bit before Murad took over and was the biggest hypocritical asshole by banning shit for everyone else other than himself. And while his rule was stable, it was only out of fear that they would be killed. Then the cherry on top of all this, Ibrahim, who is known by the public to be this depraved sex fiend who would force your daughter to be in his harem if he wished. And then on top of that, after his first grand vizier dies, he starts fucking around with other people's money and starts a war with Venice because he wanted to kill some pirates who interfered with mecha travel plans, essentially. And then because of the, the war he started, he started, he makes people pay for it. Which, you know, that's it's totally fair to do when you're essentially playing God. No one can really tell you no. But this pot was boiling over at this point. I'm talking, you were making macaroni and cheese. You forgot that that water was on, uh, like the oven was on high, not oven, but the stovetop was on high. Uh, and you, you went to go take a shit uh, and you come back and that water ha- has bubbled over into foam and has completely spilled over. And there is so much smoke in your fucking house. That's how much, that's how bad it was. Uh, and so Kosim and the current Grand Vizier saw a way out, since unlike Murad, Ibrahim actually had kids that wanted to live past infancy. And more than that, he had sons that would live past infancy. So in 1647, the Grand Vizier Salih Pasha and Kosim Sultan and the Selihusam Abrahim Effendi unsuccessfully plotted to depose the Sultan and replace him with one of his sons. Uh, Really, the plan did go swimmingly well at first, though. Uh, They were able to gather a bunch of allies and support. They secured the successor um, and kept uh, Mehmed IV uh, safe and even convinced the imperial court that a six-year-old would be better, (laughs) would be a better leader than Ibrahim. (laughs) But sadly for them, Ibrahim caught wind of it and uh, Salih Pasha was executed and Qasim Sultan was exiled from the harem completely. Salhi would be replaced by Ahmed Pasha, who was even more corrupt and pissed way more people off. And so the next year, the Janissaries and members of Ulema revolted. And on August 8th of 1648, Grand Vizier Ahmed Pasha was strang- uh, strangled and torn to shreds by an angry mob, getting the posthumous nickname Hazar Pare, or Thousand Pieces which according to accounts is no exaggeration. He was actually ripped apart and bits of his body were thrown around the Imperial palace grounds, which is fucking terrifying to think about and really makes me hope I am never in charge of a large group of people that could do that to me. Oh, on that same day, Ibrahim was seized and imprisoned in Topkapi palace. Uh, and due to Ibrahim not respecting his mother and having been a ruthless piece of shit, Qasim gave her consent to her son's fall, saying, In the end, he will leave neither you nor me alive. We will lose control of the government. The whole society is in ruins. Have him removed from the throne immediately. That was what she said. His own mom said that about him. Ibrahim's six-year-old son, Mohammed, was made sultan. The new Grand Vizier, Sofu uh, Mehmed Pasha, petitioned the Sheikh Ul Islam to sanction Ibrahim's execution. It was granted with the message, if there are two caliphs, kill one of them. Now, typically, you're not supposed to kill like uh, any previous sultan at all. Uh, you are like, that is a big fucking no-no. But the fact that he pissed off that many religious leaders that they were like, yeah, fuck it, kill him. <laughs> it's crazy. Qasim also gave her consent, knowing the monster she and her family had created, and realizing there was no hope for her baby anymore. Two executioners were sent for, one being the chief executioner who had served under Ibrahim and knew him personally. As the executioners drew closer, it was reported that Ibrahim said, Is there no one among those who have eaten my bread who will take pity on me and protect me? These cruel men have come to kill me. Mercy! Mercy! As his mother and officials watched from a palace window, they would look on as Ibrahim was strangled to death slowly. Um, And some onlookers reported that Ibrahim, while being strangled, 
had his pants fall down uh, and saw him come all over the Janis- Janissaries on the 18th of August. <laughs> <laughs> Strangled for 10 days. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, no, he didn't. He, he was strangled. He was strangled. Um, and he, he, he was uh, killed on the 18th of August of 1648. Uh, his death would mark the second regicide in the history of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and that brings us to the end of today's historical quote. So that was uh, the end of this story. Uh, it was a wild one, for damn sure. And we got to see how not just one, but two regicides happened within the span of 30 years, essentially. <laughs> to me, this really demonstrates the faults of a monarch- monarchy system and how less for power will always cause its downfall. Another thing I found super cool was uh, Qasem Sultan, who was essentially a shadow sultan for the majority of her life after Ahmed uh, died and pretty much manipulated each uh, event behind the scenes to ensure that she would remain in power in that society. I do think to an extent, the Kafez shaped Ibrahim into who he was, but at the same time, you know, that, that whole family was fucked, and the fear that came from being born into that position, I think, did more damage than being trapped for that long, to be honest. I also think Kosim didn't help him all that much, as she would essentially play into his lusts and recruit women for him um, and then hide any scandals that would happen, uh, probably making Ibrahim think that, you know, he, he could do just whatever the fuck he wanted, right? I don't know. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on all this? Do you have a favorite character in this story? Uh, after hearing this, how much, how much do you really want to rule a country now, huh? <laughs> uh, and how horrifying is the thought of getting ripped to almost a to an almost literal thousand pieces uh, sound to you. Uh, to me, it is scary as fuck. I I do not want to think about that honestly. <laughs> you can uh, let me know by reaching out to us via our social media like Facebook, uh, Instagram, or TikTok. Uh, just you can look up historical quarrels in their search bars, and you should be able to find us. Uh, you can also just email us at historicalquarrels at gmail and talk with me. Like, I'll, I'll talk with you. Uh, I do have a few announcements to make. Uh, I was r- recently interviewed by my friend Ashley on her show, The Passion Podcast. Uh, that episode should come out mid-July, so in a week or two. Please give her show a listen. She has had a ton of interesting guests who have uh, ver- a very specific passion of theirs, and I have enjoyed listening to her show quite a bit. Uh, she's, it's honestly a lot of fun, and the questions she asks are super interesting. And uh, they make you think a little bit. So uh, go give it a try. Also, uh, my, my second announcement is I am starting another podcast with one of my friends. Uh, it's going to be called Stereotypical, uh, where we are going going to be uh, shooting the shit, essentially, and just talking about things we find funny or interesting. Um, it will be a little less structured than this show, but we are working on some fun elements to engage you all. So uh, that way you aren't just listening to two buddies rambling for an hour telling inside jokes. Uh, no one wants that shit. I don't want that shit. I don't think that's fun to listen to. Um, and I'm going to be the one probably editing it. So uh, it's, it's not going to just be a ramble for a bit. We're going to do we're going to do some some cool stuff. Uh, so once that's out, give it a listen. Just look up stereotypical here in a few weeks or about a month. Honestly, it might it might take a month. You know, I forgot. I'll, I'll have an announcement. I have an announcement on one of my social pages. So give that a follow if you want to, you know, be updated. Um. Other than that, I've been pretty active on Reddit lately and talking with other podcasters who have their own shows and gave a few a listen uh, recently. And I really want to recommend you all go check out For the Love of History by TK, who talks about interesting and maybe missed historical facts that you may not have known. Um, And the other show is called uh, Trust, Don't Verify. And it's a group of friends who tell two stories. One of them is a real historical event, and the other is a completely made-up story intended to seem real. Both of these shows were a lot of fun, and I think they have a lot of similar flavor flavor to what this show is. So I wanted to share that with you guys uh, to go check out, because, you know, it's 
I want you guys to listen to other things too. Not just me, you know, that'd be cool and all, but, uh, give, give some other, other, other people to listen to. Um, neither of them asked me to do this, by the way, I just wanted to share it because I actually really like their shows a lot when I gave them a listen. I like, I thought they were really good. So I think it's worth recommending to others. That being said, um, if you like this show, please share it with your friends uh, or family that you think would enjoy it as well. And hell, if you if you can't think of anyone, just leave a review so those passing by it can see what you think about the show. Also, I'm going to end this on a sort of bittersweet note. Um, today, today, or you know, the day that I'm recording this is uh, the anniversary of a tragic event that happened in my family. And while recording this, I was reminded of the event and I just want to let each of you know that life is too short and too precious to let go of, even unintentionally. Please remember, there are many people out there who love you and want to see you succeed. You might not even know those people yet, but I can guarantee you they are out there. So don't be afraid to reach out for help or talk to someone when you need it. Don't think you're stuck in some place and, you know, you have to let yourself spiral downward just because you feel like you deserve it. Um, No, seriously, trust me when I say uh, that with uh, very few exceptions, um, and those being pedophiles, serial rapists, and murderers, uh, you, you do not deserve to be treated like shit by people, including yourself. Um, If you feel like you are unsure, um, if you can talk with anyone, at all, you can reach out to me. And while I'm not a psychologist, I will at the very least listen and try to understand. Um, you know, I'm probably going to try and point you in the right direction, which is probably going to be therapy <laughs> nine times out of 10. But honestly, like, you know, sometimes your situation might be just you needing to get out and do something like volunteer or just talking with people you haven't talked to in a while. I'm just really, I'm just reminiscing and thinking about it. Um, thinking about it really just always makes me more aware. There are people going through what the individual in my family was as well. Um, it makes me want to be at least be someone that person needed me to be back then. Uh, so reach out. Uh, don't be shy unless you're any of those three aforementioned people. Cause, uh, if I find out you are, I will probably hunt you down and kill you myself. Maybe not. I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't like those types of people. Um, but if you aren't those people, you are my people. So I, I love you guys seriously. And thank you for listening. Y'all have a good one. Stay safe, uh, stay sexy and share the knowledge.